my name is Julie Elbert and I am the director of the Winnebago Behavioral Health Department. I am here today to talk about a couple different things. We're going to talk about ACEs and what they are and how it impacts your health. And we're also going to talk about mental health and how experiences from childhood impact how healthy you are as an adult. So to begin with, I'll talk about ACEs and where they even came from. We know a lot more today about adverse childhood events because of a study that occurred in the 1990s. In um, collaboration between the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and the Kaiser Company, they studied adverse childhood experiences. So specifically, the 10 events that they were able to narrow down that cause significant impairment later in life are child abuse, and that is divided into several categories. So we're talking about physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal, mental, and emotional abuse, and neglect. And also, then we look at um, the mental stability of the caregivers for the child. If the child is living with someone who has severe depression and they're not getting help for it, <clears throat> that can have a significant impact on a child. A parent or caregiver that has an alcohol or drug addiction um, and that person or people being in a primary care role for the child that can contribute to a child um, experiencing difficulty later in life. A child um, coping with the reality of their parent or caregiver being in prison, that has an adverse impact on a child's life. Um, another thing that has a incredibly significant impact in the child's life is witnessing their mother being abused by someone in the home. The original study did not include a child witnessing their father being involved, but subsequent research found out that that equally is very harmful for a child. Further, they went on to determine that a child witnessing their siblings getting abused by someone can cause significant um, damage to the child's emotional well-being. Losing a parent to separation, divorce, or death is also a very significant loss for a child and that traumatic impact is carried with the child throughout their life. Also, they found in later studies that racism, discrimination, losing a parent to deportation, bullying, poverty, food insecurity, and living in an unsafe neighborhood all contribute to adverse childhood experiences for each person and then how they function after experiencing those into adulthood. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that and how um, children respond to it and then what you can do as an adult to try to heal from that and become um, healthier. So ACEs are experiences that harm a child's developing brain and lead to changing how they respond to stress. Trauma specifically is defined as powerful and dangerous events that overwhelm a person's capacity to cope. It's important to realize that it's not the same for everyone. Two children can experience the same traumatic event and one can be very, very impacted by it and another can be resilient and figure out how to cope and um, not suffer as big of a impact. So it's always important to treat each child individually. This is a uh, graphic that was put out by the CDC to show the progression of events that can occur in someone's life based on their experiences. So the bottom of the pyramid shows conception and it goes all the way up through death. And so the progression goes, the adverse childhood experience 
and because the brains of children are still developing and they're not equipped to make sense of what is happening, things that occur in their brain interrupt the healthy development of their brain structure. And so it has a significant impact on how the child will see the world moving forward and the decisions a child will make because they're based on their level of development and not based on a rational, mature individual who's able to weigh out everything that's going on and then determine that it wasn't their fault. So the next part on the pyramid is social, emotional, and cognitive impairment. So it does have a significant impact on their um, ability to identify and express their emo emotions appropriately. It impacts their social development and their relationships with other people, how they get along with others. And it also impacts their cognitive, it, cognitive impairment, which means their thinking processes are not um, the same as if someone was growing up in a safe home and they weren't experiencing the trauma. So as we talk a little bit more about behavior, it'll be easier to understand what is really behind the behavior of a child who's really acting out and see that it's not a bad child. It's a child that has experienced something and their behavior is a response to what they experienced based on how they made sense of it in their own mind. So the next layer of this pyramid is adoption of health risk behaviors. This is important because based on what we've experienced, it pretty much determines how well we take care of ourselves. And so if your environment was um, not one that you had healthy and abundant access to food, your behavior growing up and as a, an adult might have a response that would be food hoarding or eating whatever you could get your hands on or what you could afford, which a lot of times is not healthy food or your your health risk behavior could be um, drug seeking. It could be trying to um, emotionally escape the pain you're experiencing as a result of the trauma and you're seeking drugs. So, um, and a lot of other things. It could be not exercising or exercising too much or sleeping too much. It, it's an endless list of behaviors that one could have. Then disease disability and social problems. So by the time people are adults, they may already be suffering from chronic illnesses. They could be experiencing obesity or um, full-blown anxiety disorders or depression, um, alcoholism, drug addiction, domestic violence in their home as a response to not um, knowing how to really express their feelings appropriately social problems that end up being um, financial burdens on families and communities. And, um, and then the very last one is early death, which none of us want, especially we don't want those for our loved ones. And so this um, information here is evidence-based. The study um, has been um, replicated and um, continued 70 different times since the original publication in 1998. And so this is really good solid information for all of us to use when we are looking at our power and ability to make decisions for our own health and our also, also our ability to make changes if we can recognize that some of our decisions were based on things that happened when we were a child and those things weren't our fault. And so then we can turn that around and start taking better care of ourselves, knowing that it's up to us and we, um, we are in charge of whether we're going to be healthy and do things to take care of ourselves, or whether we're going to let this unhealthy progression continue. I'm going to change gears now and talk a little bit about what is mental health. I could ask that <clears throat> from parents and kids and wondering more specifically, what does it mean for mental wellness? 
how do you know if you're mentally healthy or if you're not mentally healthy and why does it even matter? Because do our thoughts and our emotions really have that big of an impact on the other areas of our life? And so we're gonna talk about that and use some examples to help with your understanding of mental health. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mental health com comprises three different areas of functioning. Our ability to think or our cognitive area, our feelings area or emotions, and our actions, which are our behaviors. So cognitive, emotional, and behavioral. And we want to think about that in terms of balance, that in order for any of us to be mentally healthy, we need to have a balance in those areas. It's really important to understand this, especially as a parent, because sometimes there's things we do with our children that are harmful and we don't even realize that we're doing it. And maybe we're doing it based on how we were raised and how people talk to us. But once, once you or myself or others have a better understanding of what really goes on in a child's mind, it makes it easier for us to make healthy decisions on how we speak to our kids and how we wish how we respond to the things that they experience that are traumatic. And so I want to give you <clears throat> some examples. And one example is um, if a child, if there's a, um, a storm or a, um, a tornado warning or something like that. And um, I've had parents talk to me before about their kids being really afraid of storms. And this helps sort out um, how different people think about different things. So a family could experience a, um, a tornado warning and the family all goes into the basement and um, the, you know, you're, you're down there for a while and eventually it passes and you can come back upstairs. And so perhaps the adults are thinking, oh, well, that was, took up some time, but let's get back to whatever we were doing. But the child or one of the kids might still be thinking we are in so much danger because this tornado is still coming. And so the difference in understanding how things operate or how they work is the first basis for understanding how to help a child work through their thoughts so they can be healthy. And so if we play this out further and the child was not able to understand that um, sometimes we have storms and sometimes they don't last very long and once it's passed we are technically still safe and we don't have to continue to stay downstairs to protect ourselves and um, throughout life we really um, it's a, a very small chance that we're going to experience a tornado and um, but for a child it become their reality is oh my gosh we have to really be afraid a tornado could come at any moment and we have to be ready to go downstairs. And in some cases, children are so afraid they don't even want their parents to leave the house because they could get hit or caught by the tornado when they're gone. And so some kids might feel like they need to protect their parent. And so if their parent leaves the house, they want to go with them. Even though we know rationally that there's nothing a child can do to protect their parent from a tornado realistically in the child's mind they believe they can and so a parent may recognize the child's behavior and see that they're fussing or they're crying or they're tantruming and you might look at it and think wow why is he behaving so poorly and in reality the child is trying to express their fear for you and wanting to go with you because they feel like they need to be with you so they can keep you safe and so that's one example. Another example is um, maybe fighting in the home and, um, and a child witnessing um, their mother getting hit or shoved or beat up or the reverse, a child experiencing or witnessing their father getting beat up and or abused. And the child's perception is so much bigger than what we usually realize. From the parent's perspective, they might just think, oh, just go to your room and let us be. We're having this fight. 
but in the child's mind, they have a fight or flight response going on and they're thinking the worst is going to happen. And so, especially if there's violence involved or a lot of loud noises, the child looks at it like, oh my gosh, my mom might die. And what's going to happen to me if my mom dies? And they might feel a need to save their mom or protect their mom. They also might take from this that um, if something really horrible can happen to my mom, then I might not ever be safe that this world is dangerous and my mom might always be in danger. And then again, they might resort to the belief that they are the one that has to keep their parents safe. And so they either don't want their parent to leave the house or they don't want their parent to drop them off at daycare or school because in their mind, they have to keep that parent safe because what's gonna happen to them if they no longer have that parent? This is something to keep in mind when um, a child may be at school or preschool and the child is wild. They are running around, they are, they maybe they're getting in fights or they're, um, they're very emotional. And instead of looking at it like, this is a really naughty child or this is a really bad child, what might actually be happening is you're seeing a very anxious child and the child may not have words for it. They may not be able to tell you I'm scared that something bad is going to happen to my mom today, but they have an instinctual feeling inside that I may lose the most important person in my life today. And it's driving me crazy to have to be here because I want to be with her so I can keep her safe. And again, we as adults know you are a child. How can you keep your mother safe? But that is their only frame of reference. They don't they don't have an awareness of all the other resources available to them, and they don't have words to say, if I can't be with my mom today, who can I network with so that I know she'll be safe? And so they carry that anxiety with them when they're at school, when they're at a friend's house, when they're home, and, um, and it's something that goes with kids. And so let's say you have a child who has all of this anxiety, and then you see that they have the behaviors that make them look like they're really naughty. And um, it's a good example of you've got the thought, which is um, a terrible thing for a child to have to be thinking about. And then you've got their feelings of extreme fear. And then you've got their behavior, which is very anxious and it appears to be really naughty to someone out in the community. So you have a child at that point that has very poor mental health. They are really struggling and they need um, help in sorting it out. And unfortunately, they're at a really young age where it's really hard for them to have access to good help and have um, therapists that really know what's going on in the home. But that's where parents can work to advocate for their child in preventing a situation like that, creating safety and stability in a home and responding to your child through understanding and um, being an investigator yourself and trying to figure out, wow, what am I doing or what is happening in my home that could be contributing to my child's behavior? Now imagine that child growing up and going through all these different phases in this child's life and they go through school and they get in fights and they're not fighting because they're bad, they're fighting because their, their um, impression of the world is it is not safe. And if in your own home, your mom or dad can get beat up, then you better be prepared for the time when you're gonna get beat up. So they're at school, they might be fighting, they go through middle school, they go through high school, and by the time they're in high school, they are too scared and too stressed to even stick around, so they don't wanna be there. And then, they, they don't really encounter people that really understand them. And so, um, and the only way they can get relief is maybe they start smoking pot or they get access to some other drug. Maybe they, um, they don't eat healthy or they um, don't exercise. And so by the time they're an adult, they are um, overweight or out of shape and they are already starting to develop um, a chronic health problem, which could be um, maybe they have asthma and they um, don't have access to good health care, so it's gotten really serious. Or maybe 
they develop diabetes because they, um, they didn't realize that their eating patterns were not healthy for them and they didn't realize that they really needed to exercise to take good care of themselves. And then they get to be in their 20s or their 30s and they're in a relationship and all of a sudden they're reliving the same dynamic that occurred in their home where um, they don't trust each other and they're fighting and pretty soon they have children themselves and their own kids are watching this happen and their own kids are watching mom get beat up or dad get beat up and their kids that are going to school. And it's a repeat of a cycle that is um, very scary and sad. And, um, and then the, um, the individual that maybe this started with, they get to be in their, their 40s or their 50s and um, things have progressed to the point where then they, um, they die. They die really young. And, um, but their body is, is worn out and their, um, their lifestyle and their experiences contributed to their, their health conditions. And, um, and how would their life have been different if they knew, wow, you know, something, some really bad things happen to you, but there is help available and you can, um, you can get into therapy and research has found that. Cognitive behavioral therapy is one response to help with adverse childhood events so that people can learn to um, reframe their thoughts so that they don't have to believe that just because they witness something bad happening in their home, that the whole world is like that and that they are good and, um, and smart and worthy of love and worthy of um, positive things happening. And think about um, if, if they had learned early on that, wow, that bad thing happened in my home, but my parents got help. And now they are, um, they're getting along really well. And um, I don't have to worry about mom being in danger, dad being in danger, and I don't have to worry that we're not going to have food to eat. And I, I have somebody to help me with my homework and make sure I'm at school. And if, um, if someone is threatening me at school, I can talk to my mom or my dad or my grandma or my auntie, and they'll help me figure out how to solve that problem. And I don't have to have a really negative experience at school because I trust adults and I trust that people are going to help me work through my problems because I see the world as a safe place and I can, um, I can go to school and trust that I'm going to make friends that aren't going to bully me and I can, um, I can do well in school and put the amount of time into it because I know that I'm smart and that I can set goals and reach them because I believe in myself. And I, um, I can um, not worry that there's not going to be enough to eat because we have enough food and I can exercise and I learn healthy ways to take care of myself so that by the time I'm on my own, I, I'm balanced. I have healthy thoughts. I manage my emotions and I don't let them um, get out of control so I'm provoked to act on them in an unhealthy way. And my behaviors are positive and I use my ability to choose my behaviors to take good care of myself. I can eat healthy and I can exercise and I can do things that are good for me and my family and avoid things that um, are harmful and that I, um, I, and I trust my decision making and know that I can make good decisions because I have worked through the things that occurred in my childhood that had the potential to really harm me, but now I know that um, I don't have to let them because I've been able to work through it in therapy. So I brought these rocks along to show, you know, if you, if you had four or five um, adverse events in your life, it's like having these and 
these are going to be in your heart your whole life or your kidneys or wherever. Unless you go and work through them, these are going to be, you know, maybe think of it, it's in your hand. And because you're carrying those, you can never use this hand again to do anything to help yourself because you are overloaded by the trauma that you've experienced. And um, if you can work through it and you can let these go, and it, it takes some work. It, I, I won't kid you, it's, it's a process, but there are, are services available to help with this um, if you can commit to yourself that you're worth it and that you did experience these things and that um, you want to be able to work through them and let them go, you have the potential to make good decisions for yourself. And I brought these crystals to represent positive things that happen, that things, you know, you learning that you are smart, you learning that you have purpose in your life, that you are loved and you belong to your family and community and um, your, your people, your relatives, and you, um, you feel some joy in life and you feel some um, your spirituality and you are able to, um, you're able to participate in your traditions and, and basically just feel a part of something that's bigger than yourself. And you know you have um, talent, you have the ability to do some good things for others and that you can, um, you can keep functioning every day without using drugs or thinking bad things about yourself. These are forms of light and they, um, they, can, they can guide you to, um, to have a healthy life and healthy, healthy thoughts. And so um, that's where the balance comes in is healthy thoughts lead to um, healthy and manageable emotions and those contribute to individuals making healthy choices. Another part of it is there's really good material out there for um, resources available. Really, you know, the research shows that everybody most likely has at least one. And most people who have at least one have more than one they're saying. And so um, this gives you some really good ways to um, interact with your kids so that you um, can convey to them those things that are really crucial for a child's development, like nurture and protect your kids as much as possible. Be active with them, move and play. Make eye contact with them so they know that you see them and you, um, you're present with them and you're connecting with them. Be able to say you're sorry to your kids. Actually, that's a gift for yourself. When you get to the point where you realize you don't have to be a perfect parent and that you're allowed to make mistakes and that as long as you can own them and share them with your kids, really what you're showing your kids is you are human and that will help them in growing up so they don't have to believe or feel that they're um, damaged because they're not perfect because none of us are. Um, give 20 second hugs so they can really feel your love come through and um, slow down or stop. Pause and take breaks so you're not so um, involved in intense interactions. Um, when you realize you might be in a situation that could have a, a bad ending, just pause, take a break from it and start, start again when you're both calm. Another thing is identify the good things that your kids are doing. These things, the things that you want to identify and you want them to remember as they're growing up um, and point them out. I know sometimes it's really hard because you've got one big thing they did wrong and you're thinking, oh, if they'd only changed that, everything would be better. But even at that moment when you're so angry with them, it's important to also find some of those positive things they're still doing along the way so that you keep it in perspective and that will influence how your, re your reaction or your response is to your child and that they're not a bad person and they don't deserve to be treated poorly because no one does better when they're made to feel bad. To come up with some kind of a response or solution for the situation, that's not going to beat them down. Be there for your kids. Um, it's hard to see them in pain 
and to see them suffering. But sometimes really all we have to do is be present and support them while they're figuring it out instead of trying to solve the problem for them. Help your kids express their mad and sad and hard feelings. And, um, and then share some times in your life when you experience something like that. I have found with my kids, they have grown and responded to me so much better when I've told them how I really messed up than if I'm bragging to them about something I feel like I did really well. They, that they can't relate to. So if I say, yeah, I've been in your situation and this is what I do, and you both end up laughing because you both know how embarrassing something feels, then you can help and encourage them to move forward and, and make good choices. And then the last one, which is the light bulb, is keep learning. We don't have all the answers. And, um, and there are so many new things that kids are doing and involved in and opportunities for other adverse childhood events to occur. And so stay connected and be open to learning and know that as parents, we're all in the same, um, I guess maybe we're, we're all in similar situations in terms of trying to keep up with all the new information that's available and that um, no one has all the answers or knows what it's all, all about. I wanna end on a positive note and share some information that is hopeful. When children's positive experiences outweigh the negative, the child is more likely to have positive outcomes later in life. Our communities are rich with protective factors to provide these essential positive experiences, including native traditions, language, spirituality, time with elders, and connectedness. I wanna thank you for watching and encourage you to reach out to Winnebago Behavioral Health Department to assist you with um, any questions you may have or um, to access mental health therapy services.